really my pleasure to introduce Mary Collins. And, and I think if, as you listen closely, you'll understand why. <laughs> so, the Honorable Mary Collins is the recipient of two honorary degrees from Royal Roads, one from the Military College and one from the University. She served on the Royal Roads University Board of Governors for the last five years. She's been a member of Parliament for Capilano House Sound from 1984 to 1993, during which time she held cabinet posts including, and this is a bit of a list, so listen up, Associate Minister of National Defense, Western Economic Diversification Minister, Minister of State Environment, and Minister of National Health and Welfare. Mary's involvement in health policy practice includes five years in Russia with the World Health Organization from 2002 to 2007, and today she's the director of the Secretariat of the BC Healthy Living Alliance. It's really an honor, Mary, to have you with us today to facilitate a conversation on leadership with one of our spring honorary degree recipients. Please join me in welcoming Mary. Whichever one you like. Drinks for us. Yeah. So Cheers. Well, th thank you, uh, Catherine, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Alan, and thank all of you for being here today. As mentioned, a lot of you are graduating tomorrow, and you're here with your family and friends, and and ready to get on with all the leadership that you've learned here at Royal Roads. And as well, I know we've got friends and fellows and very distinguished guests to be part of this conversation with this most distinguished honorary degree recipient uh, uh, tomorrow. And General Walter Natinchik, I'm sure you all have heard about him. Um, he grew up in Winnipeg. He was a, started his career in the military as a cadet there, came on here to Royal Roads, and of course ended up in the highest post possible in the armed forces as chief of the defense staff, where he was responsible for the thousands and thousands of uh, women and men who serve in the armed forces in a $20 billion a year budget. A lot of money, we know that. Um, since he left, uh, retired from that position, he is not retired from leadership and public service because he went on to be the head of the Canadian Space Agency, and he may talk a little bit about that. That was something entirely different. And then just last uh, November, uh, the Prime Minister asked him to take on the role as Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs, another really important role where he's now responsible for looking after those who have served in the armed forces and is really making a big difference there. So. Uh, Welcome so much. I can call you Walt, I understand. Absolutely. My wife said if I said Walter, that meant he was in trouble. So it's, it's Walt today. Um, you must have so many stories to share with us. But let's go back. Think about the young lad, I think 17, leaving Winnipeg and the cold and winds of Portage and Maine and coming out here to Victoria to, to Royal Roads Military College. What was your first reaction? Uh, Mary, th <clears throat> Mary, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, and, and Alan, thanks for, for uh, this incredible honor. And I just want to say before, before I start, I'm humbled because I have all of these leaders here in front of me, um, and I've got to watch uh, what I say because my wife, Leslie, is right here. <laughs> and, um, and normally I, I try to use a parade square voice, but I'm mic'd up here, so and Leslie will remind me not to yell. Um, I'm also accompanied by uh, Michelle Duaron, who's the Assistant Deputy Minister of, of Service Delivery and Veterans Affairs, who is a graduate alumnus here of Royal Roads as well. Uh, so let me just say, first of all, I'm humbled. And I've got to be careful what I say because I've got two vice chiefs. I've got a <laughs> former commander of the Army. Um, I've got a, a, a classmate, uh, Richard Greenwood, out here. And you know, if if uh, if he holds up the um, the card, I gotta watch what I say because so much of what occurred back here in '75, '76 is classified information. Right, <laughs> absolutely. So I arrived as a 17-year-old from from Winnipeg, and and let me just say that indeed, Royal Roads changed my life. Um, I remember getting on a Pacific Western uh, airline 737 in Winnipeg. And I sat down beside this fellow who had a massive red Afro haircut, just out to here, almost beyond his shoulders. 
And so we rode all the way. His name was John Turnbull. And we, we flew out here. And, and when we arrived at Victoria Airport, the senior cadets were, in our minds, superhuman. Superhuman. Um, and they were extraordinary in their professionalism, in their, uh, in their poise, um, and they had very loud voices. And we kind of went into a shock, a uh, shock that, landed about, uh, that lasted about four or five months. Uh, and so I didn't recognize John Turnbull again until Christmas, because that afro disappeared like that. <laughs> it became a, a brush cut, but it kind of captured the fact that when we arrived here, we didn't know what to expect. The, the college kind of has this, this um, extraordinary persona of welcoming in all these young Canadians, showing them what right looks like, and expecting them all to attain that level of excellence. And I reflected on this, you know, that it was excellence, it was teamwork, and it was leadership. Um, all kind of captured in this sense of family. Keeping in mind that Royal Roads in that time um, had about 200 cadets. So over the course of a year or two years, you knew everybody. You knew their first name, you knew their last name, you knew where they were from. And so in answer to your question, I mean, the, the sense of family that we had here, the activities that were either um, you know, quite organized like all the parades, or the extraordinary times up in the gravel pit that's in the back here, late at night on a weekend, and the rest is classified. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I also understand that you were quite a singer in your time at Royal Roads, and one of your favorite songs was Eric Carmen's All By Myself. Is that still in your repertoire? Or well, you can share with us a few of your memories of uh, that. Uh, just to say, is, uh, and I think it's around that campfire in the gravel pit, but it was a choir. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a choir trying to, try to keep up with all the rest of those angelic voices uh, <laughs> from these other great Canadians who were 17, 18. In fact, some of our friends were 16 when they arrived. Um, but the sense of spirit that we had here was amazing. Um, we were encouraged to use our um, initiative uh, and our imagination. There was this little concept called Skylarks. And a Skylark was a very deliberately planned military operation that often happened in the middle of the night. And you would do things like you would take a Volkswagen and put it on top of the castle. Uh, <laughs> Like you would, you, would, you would take captive the entire cadet wing headquarters and put them in the liquor lockup for the night. Um, you know, you would, you, you would do things that were extraordinarily well executed, but for a purpose of building spirit. And singing was part of it. Um, but it was really engendering this sense of spirit and camaraderie. Well, I hope we don't lose that sense of spirit. Sometimes I get a bit concerned that we have become too rigid in, in some of these areas uh, as a society, not, not at Royal Roads, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, there is a lot. If you go to, any, if you go to um, Royal Military College today or Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean, you will see that same, same spirit, spirit. and it's wonderful to see. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as Alan and Catherine have said, we're celebrating 75 years uh, of the combined, the, the military college and the university of changing lives. They've changed your lives, changing the lives, I think, of the graduates who are here and their experiences. And certainly leadership is, is really key to that. Um, so can you think about some examples of what you learned here as a cadet that really has had an impact on your ability to be a world-class leader in your career? You, you know, what we learned here was the idea of selecting those individuals, those Canadians who wanted to lead, giving them all of the instruction and development to lead, and then stepping back and allowing them the opportunity to lead, recognizing that mistakes will occur along the way, but as long as mistakes occur because of an act of omission rather than commission, and no one got hurt, and the damage wasn't that bad, give them an opportunity to lead. 
And you know, I reflected on this. So, you know, one of my mentors, I mean, there's a number of my mentors who are here in this front row, but one of my mentors was a guy named Major General Clive Milner. And later, you know, in 1996, I assumed command of my regiment, and he kind of captured in three lines what I had learned here. The idea that you select these incredible Canadians to lead. You put them through this process here at this college. Whereas first, uh, second years and third years and fourth years, you gave them an opportunity to lead their brethren, their peers. And then you step back and you allow them to do that. And sometimes I think society has this uh, risk-adverse approach. And you don't develop leaders that way. And I still remember when we left the military colleges, we were ready to lead because of the confidence that we had from the military colleges. Because while we were here and through the development, we had seen what right looked like. And what right looked like was not only in, in the upperclassmen and women, so to speak, but also in the, in the officers and the instructors and the professors who were here. And you wanted to emulate that, that sense, that standard of excellence. You, you saw what right looked like and you, wanted, you knew it would work. And so once you graduated off here, you wanted to, to in fact, uh, allow those men and women that you were gonna lead in your units, in your squadrons, in, in your ships, that same kind of opportunity. And so that's one of the things that I, I took away from here. And recognizing that accepting risk is really tough. But if you don't do that, people don't learn. And you have to realize that, that when they do make mistakes, stop it, correct it, and then let them do it again. Mm -hmm. Because when you reach a, a level of, of senior leadership, you've made it. You've got to prepare others to take your place which is really essential in our military. In Afghanistan, and the mission in Afghanistan taught us that time and time again, where leaders were wounded, leaders, leaders got injured in, in combat, and then the NCOs and officers had to step up. It's too late to train them then. It's too late. You have to take the opportunity early, identify who has the wherewithal to lead, and give them that opportunity. So how have you taken some of those lessons and those experiences from your military career back into civilian life at the Space Agency and now at Veterans Affairs, very different kinds of organizations and, and certainly operate in different ways. What, what have you been able to take from your leadership experiences and apply there? It's, uh, it's in, in the public service, it's really interesting because um, unlike the military, their program for training and professional development is not as comprehensive. I don't think anywhere in, in public uh, office or in, um, in industry um, is the training uh, and development as extensive as in the military, because in the military, we're allowing people, uh, young men and women uh, uh, Canadians, um, and, and we're, we're sending them to very difficult locations and expecting them to use their wisdom, use their knowledge, and if required, to use lethal force, but within a disciplined framework of, of decision making. In the public service, what I find is we, we don't have enough training and development. And so in the, in the space agency and, and in veterans affairs, I have tried, and, and the leadership we have tried, to give people the opportunity to lead and to give them experiences outside of their, their normal environment. And it's really difficult to do. In the public service, you can't post someone from location A to location B. They have a significant say. <laughs> you know, I've had 17 moves, <laughs> and it's, it's tough to do that. But we do a lot of uh, job shadowing now, um, bringing executives along uh, with me, along with the leadership, to see what senior leaders do. Um, those, those folks who, have, who are really have uh, potential, sending them off on uh, professional development courses with the military and with the public school, uh, uh, public service school. Um, but it, it, is, it is a work in progress. I wish I did more in the space agency. I was there for just more than a year, and now I'm in month eight uh, right. of, of Veterans Affairs. So we started the job shadowing, um, doing town halls across the country, and just kind of uh, sharing with them the kinds of things I've already mentioned just now about identifying um, succession early, giving them the training, and then giving them the opportunity to lead. 
and allowing them to take risk, because I think that's something from my experience in the public sector is often not valued. In fact, there's a great concern about taking risks often in, uh, in government areas. So how have you been able to sort of overcome that? Concern? You know, and, and again, I would say in, in the case of, um, of Veterans Affairs, um, where uh, we have folks who are doing the very best they can do, uh, and giving them a structure that where they can make decisions and have much more flexibility to to apply the three the three words that we use our motto now is care compassion and respect mm. do the utmost to care for our, our men and women who have served and sacrificed so much for Canada if there's a default setting if there's a decision they have to make in the gray zone default to compassion because if you default to compassion rarely will you be wrong and then finally, at all times, to act with respect for people who have done so much. So, and again, looking at if people make a mistake, as long as they exercise compassion, and I said to them, I said to our Victoria office yesterday, and our team that's working alongside uh, uh, the Navy and the Army and the Air Force here at the Integrated Personnel Support Center, working for Steve, Captain Navy Steve Waddell over there, I said, as long as you act with compassion, you can't be far from wrong. I really like that. Care, compassion, respect. I think that could apply in a lot of different <coughs> venues, yeah. Let's go back to some of the, um, the approaches and what you've learned at, at Royal Roads and how you've been able to apply that. And certainly, if you think about leadership, teamwork is really essential. And can you think about some examples of how what you learned here at Royal Roads that you've been able to apply and you think is important for the folks here? in terms of developing teams? You know, this is um, really one of, the, one of the key themes of what I've learned from Rhodes, the sense that it's not about you. Uh, it's about the success of the whole. It's about being part of something and some group that is larger than yourself. You, you know, as I, as I look around here right now, and here we are on the quarter deck, and, and there's the hallway to the, to the, um, to the mess and below, the mess was the locker rooms where we kept our rifles and our belts and those kinds of things. You know, we would have some cadets, those, those rare cadets who got into a little bit of trouble. They would get into trouble and, and they would be charged. And a senior cadet would charge them and would assign a, a, a punishment. And normally it was withdrawal of privileges. And some of them were pretty extensive in terms of the withdrawal of privileges. And what was clear was that cadet could not, uh, could not meet um, the, the punishment unless his entire peer group helped him out. That no, that no one could actually get through it unless other people were polishing his boots, pressing his pants, making sure everything was ready. And it was the sense that the entire team had to stay together all the way through this and cross that finish line together in every competition, whether it was the obstacle course or you name it, it had to be the whole group. It wasn't about any individual. And that's what's so key about the military. It's to realize that it's not about any individual. When you serve, you are serving a greater good. And that greater good will not be met unless everyone subordinates themselves to that higher need. If they cannot do that, then they'll just stand out alone. But that was inculcated in us here. I'm not sure that's inculcated in other parts of society in the same way. And yet teamwork is essential no matter if you're in the military or the private sector or civil society, whatever. Absolutely. So you still have to take some of those lessons and apply them. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the other things I know you've talked about is the importance of trust in leadership. Can you? Talk a little more about that. You know, I um, remember I was on exchange with the U.S. and, um, and uh, preparing for a deployment, and we had a, a, a four-star, retired four-star, talk to us about um, uh, effective operations and what, what it was all about. And he said, I just want to give you three words. Relationships, 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 all built upon trust that because it's about the team, because it's being part of greater, some, greater than, uh, than, than you know, the sum of the parts, 
because, especially in the military, you have these extraordinarily difficult uh, conditions uh, in austere, in austere uh, environment. People are tired. They need to help each other. The foundation of all of that is trust. The fact that there is absolutely no hesitation in trusting your shipmates, your trench buddies, your air crew, when you are in the kind of circumstances that you are, because your survival, your success, the success of the whole, is built upon the trust on the capability, the decision making, the professionalism, that sense of excellence by everyone around you. And it's interesting, just you know, a month and a half ago, I was, had the great privilege of being in the Netherlands with these uh, World War II vets. Mm. And, and again, to see the trust that they had in each other. You, you, you know, high school chums, and one of them is standing in the Holton um, Cemetery looking at his high school chums, a headstone, and just thinking, about why they were there together in the sense that the two had trust in each other. I would say to you that there's nothing more important than that sense of, of trust that you know and that can anticipate what your friend, what your brethren will do because indeed when you're coming through a college like this, and I just said we had 200 cadets here, all of them were family. And that family was based upon trust. As you do with your usually with your own family, too. Absolutely. But again, for those who haven't had that experience in the military and had those wonderful opportunities that you and some of the others have had, how do you engender that sense of trust in a, a other kinds of organizations? You know, it's difficult to do um, because the automatic advantage of the military, they have these things called uniforms. Mm. Okay, because the uniforms kind of identify the whole, the whole resume is on that uniform. You know, the fact that someone's wearing a Navy uniform, an Army uniform, Air Force uniform, whether they have para wings or submariner wings or pilot wings, but then they have all of these ribbons, which is like an automatic CV. Like the CV is right there. You can look at someone and say, oh, you were in Bosnia, you've been in the Gulf, you've been in this campaign and that campaign. So you look at someone and automatically you know about shared experiences or maybe shared you know, friends and so on and automatically you have that basis. And I would say this about the, the public service. I said the problem with the public service, they don't have uniforms. Mm -hmm. They don't have uniforms. And yet, you know, in the same way that in the, in the Army, Navy, the Air Force, you have three distinct cultures. And then there's subcultures, like there's infantry and there's armor, artillery, or there's fighter pilots or transport pilots and maritime and so on. All of these are cultures and subcultures. Well, in the public service, there's the same in the sense that there is a justice culture. There is a trade culture. There is a finance culture. There is a fisheries and oceans culture. And in fact, when I was with the space agency, I had the science and engineering culture. Right, yeah. You know, and each of these were, in, in a way, using the word tribes, they were kind of like tribes. And, and, and yet there was no CV saying, well, you worked, like in the space agency, you worked on this satellite, or you worked on the International Space Station, or you worked on, on this astronaut mission. There was nothing of that. And so the real challenge in the public service, like it is in, in the commercial sector, is how do you bring people together, break down the barriers so they actually have that discussion about what their shared experiences are? Because the moment they realize they have their shared experiences and they have friends in common, then the barriers start breaking down. And often what happens is people get together in a formal setting, and that doesn't work. They need to go into an informal setting. And whenever I spoke to a staff college or a university course, MBA course, I'd say, you know, the best thing you can do is just put your homework aside and go to the bar. Mm. Even if you have a soft drink or whatever, but the fact is you might have a frank discussion and you find out about who these people are as opposed to sitting around a table and trying to come to an agreement, which won't work. Now, you once said that ambition is the enemy. Uh, you described it as a yoke on your shoulders. So talk a bit about that, because you've, you've talked about you know, the, the trust, and yet obviously people do have to be ambitious 
and there is competition uh, in the armed forces as there is in every sector. How do you, and how do you balance yeah. all that? Well, let me just say, um, I, I want to give credit to that whole line of thought to someone who's in, in the audience, and that's Lieutenant General Kent Foster. Mm -hmm. So in 1987, February 1987, General Foster was a Brigadier General and the commander of, uh, of the uh, Special Service Force Brigade in Petawawa. And we had this extraordinary exercise in a place called Iqaluit. Uh, Iqaluit, which is up on Frobisher Bay and Baffin Island, and we brought 300 um, sailor, soldiers, airmen, and women for an exercise in Iqaluit. And we brought up all of our armored vehicles up there. It's called Exercise Lightning Strike 87. And in the middle of the exercise, um, General came up to visit his, his troops, and he got snowed in. We had terrible weather. I think on a good day with wind chill was minus 104. Anyway, during this long period of time, the aircraft were not going back and forth, so I think we were eating Arctic char soup and caribou stew by that point. Uh, but we did go down to the Legion, and we had a few pop. And I'd seen, through my experience, some of my pals were getting promoted. Uh, and as they were getting promoted, I saw their personality change. So I asked, I asked the general, I said, General, what happens when a person kind of you know, moves up the food chain here? And it seems as if their character changes. He said, what do you mean? Am I taking liberties with you here, General? So you jump in here if you don't like it. <laughs> They said, well, I said, you know, if someone's an officer cadet, someone's a lieutenant or a captain, you can have a very frank discussion with them. You can share your innermost thoughts. You can trust them. And then it seems to get to a certain rank, and they change. Why is that? And, uh, and he said, uh, first of all, he said, uh, the rank that they change at is lieutenant colonel. You know? um, and I think the line was, at what rank level do they become a twit? <laughs> and it was Lieutenant Colonel. And I've shared this with, with my civilian staffs, because in civilian parlance in the public service, it's director. It's now been internalized. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I said, so why is that? And he said, because people become ambitious. You know, they become, they become ambitious because they think they have a shot for the top. And they put themselves ahead of the good of the organization. They put themselves ahead of the good of their peers and the unit because they, they want to get to the top. And, and I've shared this lesson, just so you know, General, this is your lesson. I've shared that it was numerous staff college courses. Then I asked the question, and, and it again, came from the general. At what point in your life do you declare success? Do you realize that you are happy with your lot in life and you recognize it's, it's not about you? And like for, when I was an air cadet, I was an air cadet for five years before I got here, I wanted to be a captain. Not a Navy captain, a captain. Because when I was an air cadet, the captain was on a pedestal. And I said, gee, I really would like to be a captain to make it better for those cadets and others. And so when I got to the rank of captain and figured things out a little bit and at my first regimental tour, I said, you know, my, my ambition is to be a commanding officer of my unit. That's it. But to set a goal that you can achieve where you are honestly, sincerely happy and you remove any kind of a yoke from you, uh, that is beyond what is reasonable so that you're unhappy. Because again, one of the thoughts that the general shared is, you know, there are actually people who get promoted to the rank of three star or three maple leaf admirals or generals, and they consider themselves failures. And yet, it's so extraordinary to reach that high office. And so this has been my lesson, and what was so happy is I'd be in, in Afghanistan somewhere and have a company commander, platoon commander, regimental commander come up to me and say, sir, I heard that staff college lesson. I've just declared success. Hmm. I've just declared success. And I knew what it meant. Because they were happy. And the moment you realize that, that you don't want that next job too much, 
then the fact is you will never compromise your values to do what is right. That you will never undermine trust to do what is right. So how did you avoid being a twit? <laughs> <laughs> My wife. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> She would say to me, Walt, don't change. Mm. Don't change. You know, I met her when I was a lieutenant in Lahr, in Lahr, Germany. And just, uh, you know, a gorgeous school teacher, and now a gorgeous mom and grandmother. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, back then, she introduced me to her students as Lieutenant Walt, because they could not pronounce my surname. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so all the way through, it was, hey, listen, don't change from Lieutenant Walt. How are we true you know, to the characteristics to our nature that made us who we are, that we don't change? You know, and, and I know some who work with me would get frustrated because you know, when I was chief of defense, they, they gave me this car, and it was great. So the driver came around, opened my door, and said, stop. And I went around and opened his door. <laughs> I said, sir, what are you doing? I said, I know how to work the door. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. But they know that you have to do things so you don't change. Be true to who you are. But don't create the conditions that you would ever put your values and trust at risk. I think that's a hard lesson for lots of folks. Is there's so much pressure to succeed, and, and whether it's in the game, the private sector, the public sector, or whatever, that uh, people feel they should be constantly moving ahead. Well, I'll share with you again. Um, you know, I got a phone call that asked me to be a candidate, to be a vice chief. And, and I, I'm looking at two vice chiefs who are here, um, Admiral Garnett and Admiral Donaldson. And they said, do you want to be the vice? And I said, heck no. <laughs> There's no way. It's too hard. <laughs> And I watched Admiral Garnett, I think he was in the job four years. You know, Bruce Donaldson was in the job three years. And it was the toughest job going. And, and the fact is that if you want the job too much, then you're putting ambition ahead. You're putting yourself ahead of the, the greater mission. And this is the issue. And this is why I believe that ambition is a problem. And if you cannot resolve this, then you have to really ask yourself, why are you going for that higher office? Because those who work for you, they will see through everything. Yeah. By the way, I should have mentioned that there's going to be an opportunity for, for you to ask questions. We have a couple of mics here, so just uh, keep those in mind. As soon as we finish this part of the conversation, it's going to be your turn to get engaged in the, the conversation. So I, I hope that you will. So. Walt, as we sort of think to winding up some of these thoughts, can you kind of summarize what in your mind are the key essential ingredients required to be a successful leader? And are there things that perhaps generally you read about these days that you talk about leadership that you think aren't important, that we should be taking off the list? You know, I think people always remember things in threes. and. Um... And when I was here, um, the threes uh, were, were the values of Royal Roads. Uh, truth, duty, valor. Um, truth, duty, valor um, has been kind of my code throughout uh, my experience. And as I look at uh, the values of the Canadian Forces, which is in service, service before self, integrity, loyalty, and courage that brings honor to country, you can take all that, take it apart, and it comes back to truth, duty, valor. You can take the public service um, values and, again, take it apart, and it brings you back to truth, duty, valor. And I think this is really key, the idea of truth, where you live, act, and speak the truth at all times. And, and you know, when I was the chief, I would say to, to the leadership, when they're handling tough issues, I, I would give them a code tied to this truth. The first was, when you have a difficult situation, go ugly early. Deal with it right away. Don't put it off, because when you put it off, it gets worse. 
Second, accept responsibility. If it happened on your watch, and even if it was an act of omission or commission, it doesn't matter, but if you're responsible, accept responsibility. Everything settles down. And if, they're, if they fire you, hey, listen, you didn't want the job anyway. Okay. Third, if the record is wrong, correct the record. Because people know the truth, they want to hear the truth, they want to know that people have the courage to actually correct it. And finally, on this truth bit, is whenever you speak, speak to the truth. Speak to those people who work for you. They know the truth, they want to hear the truth. The external audience, they'll, they'll believe what your sailors, soldiers, airmen, and women believe. That's the truth. Duty. You always put your duty, your mission, your purpose ahead of yourself. And so much of the duty is working, for, working so that those who are working for you are successful. Enable their success. And especially after the experience of Afghanistan or Libya, the, the various Gulf missions, Haiti, the Olympics. These are tough missions. And you don't, you don't stop unless your men and women are successful. And to the degree that you can, mitigate the risks, the tremendous risks they're going through. And if tragedy occurs, then respect them, respect their families. And then the final piece was valor. Have the courage to do what is right. And it is tough. Some of these issues, awful issues, would come up. And the advice would be, don't go there, don't do this. And you go, stop. There are those who have no choice but to be there and are dealing with these things. You have to be courageous and go because the most courageous person is that man or woman, sailor, soldier, airman or woman who are at the point of the spear dealing with this now, be beside them. So living values. Hmm. Great values, yeah. But I don't know if you can share with us, but have you had experiences where you have been urged to perhaps avoid the full truth for whatever reasons, political or whatever, and how have you dealt with it? I had a tragedy in Trenton, uh, a criminal act by a leader. Terrible, absolutely atrocious. And I remember that I heard about it on a Monday afternoon, and I was, it was, I was beyond belief that this had occurred. And, and some of the advice came to me and said, hey, don't go. I said, we're, we're going. We're going tomorrow. And I grabbed the commander of the Air Force and others, and we went to Trenton. Had a town hall in the uh, gymnasium at Base Trenton. Had about 1,500 airmen and women and, and soldiers and, and sailors. Had all the mayors, all the mayors up front. And put in perspective, I said, this is the act of an individual. I said, this is an extraordinarily professional team, family, great people, who at that point in time were supporting operations in Afghanistan. We had another 4,000 people training in California to go to Afghanistan. The Winter Olympics were on right here in, uh, in British Columbia. And we had our mission on in Haiti. And Trenton was the hub of all of that. Operations around the world. And I remember one airman, he stood up and he said, sir, this morning I came to work in my uniform and I was pumping gas and someone came up to me and spit it. And said, you know, should we all change in a civilian clothes and not wear uniforms to work? I said, stop. We're not going back to where we were. We're not going back. I said, what you saw is the normal reaction to grief. And the first phase is anger. And they will get through their stages of grief, but you are a professional force. You will stand tall, you will stand proud, you will wear that uniform proudly. And I said, you know, right after this, I'm going to, I'm going to Tim Hortons to go get a large double-double. And I said, if you want to come with me, all 1,500, bring money. <laughs> and I was asked by the media that day, and you can look at the, you know, the CBC report. And I was asked, don't you feel personally responsible for this? 
I said, I am responsible for 100,000 men and women in the armed forces. For all of them. The good, the bad. But this is an extraordinary professional force. But we are also a reflection of society. And when bad things happen, we've got to deal with it with to the highest standards that Canadians could expect because we have this trust that we are caring for the national treasure of our nation, that's our sons and daughters. So if that was, I would assume, one of the worst days of your career? No. No? The worst days of my career was every day I stood in Trenton for the repatriation of our sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And what were the best days? The best days were um, being on top of a mountain in Kandahar, on top of a Leopard 2 tank um, on Christmas Eve. And some of the political leaders we were, were with us handing out Olympic mittens to these sergeants mm -hmm. on duty. <laughs> I wanted to turn in my pay that day. It was standing on um, the wing of a ship with Steve Waddell, HMCS Fredericton, coming back from a very, very successful mission. And it was going up to this little point in the northeastern Saskatchewan called um, Four Points uh, to join a ranger patrol. And the Ranger Patrol was dropped off by one of Her Majesty's Canadian ships in Kitimat, BC. And with snow machines, they were going overland from Kitimat, British Columbia, to Churchill, Manitoba, by snow machines. And these were Rangers, some of who were Inuit, some were First Nations, but others were is Canadians from down south who moved north who decided that they were bored living in the Paw or any one of these small communities and decided to join the Rangers. And as I'm out here on this incredible snow machine going through about five feet of snow with this Ranger Patrol, this black wolf came out of the bush and was bounding the snow alongside us. And I said, I gotta turn in my pay. <laughs> But to see the professionalism of these folks, and oh, by the way, it's about minus 35, you know, or to see the professionalism of those, those NCOs on top of the mountain, or to see the sailors aboard the ship. And I can't tell you about our special forces folks because they're extraordinary. But every one of those days, to recognize that our men and women in uniform don't take a backseat to any other force in the world. They're amongst the most professional force in the world. And so every day was extraordinary. That's great. I, I'm sure all the folks here would, would second that. Yeah. Um, we do have time for some questions. So would you like to come and use the microphone so that everyone can hear? And we'd really appreciate it if you would be willing to share with us your name or if you're a Royal Road student or graduate. Sit on. I am fascinated by your words and thoughts, so sorry for my emotion. Um, I am the proud wife of a man who is here who served the Canadian Forces, and I have a question for your wife, actually. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, I love it. <laughs> She's looking a little offended up here. Leslie. As such, I would like to know what is what you have done to support your husband in his life, what are the day-to-day -day things that you do to make his life easier, better, so that we can hear that and perhaps take it in consideration? Thank you. Leslie, Riel. <laughs> that was a lovely question. Would you be willing to respond? Can I, can I just say a few, yeah. th few things, just of introduction? I mean, sure. OK. Well. Oh. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yes, dear. <laughs> it's a very hard question. Uh, I would say Walt's dedicated. I married Walt after he was through his colleges. And I met him in teaching 
me, and I met him. Need the microphone uh, a little closer. It's oh, now. and a dashing yeah. young man he was. Um, and I gave up my job, so I'm one of these lucky people without a pension in order to follow him around the world, literally. And I think one of the things that I did for Walt is he, it, military, it's hard to have a balance. And so we were always very close, even though we've been married. 33 years. That many years. <laughs> and Friday. OK. <laughs> Okay, and uh, had to get married twice, but um, it, it was, he was away so much and was making sure that he had a family, always. So whenever he was away, we would, um, and we didn't have great things like phones and everything else that you have now to be in contact, which sometimes makes it harder, right? And to be in constant contact, I was very used to the over, how are you doing, dear? I'm fine, thanks. Over. And somebody <laughs> listening on the other Everybody end to it, I found out later. So all, all of those, yes, that you remember also, all of those wonderful things. But he was very much part of our children's life. So even though he was away for a year, we spent a lot of time, and life was like a honeymoon every time he came back. He could catch up immediately because, you know, he was, um, he knew who the children's teachers were. They all had their files. The kids had first 24 hours with him and then I got all the rest of the time. Um, and, and it was that constant correspondence that we were in uh, and sharing so many things and understanding and making allowances because, you know, we all hear about the mental health now. And, and I watched Walt. Um, after he had been in Cyprus, and after he had been in Bosnia, and after he had been in Iraq, and some of the phone calls. That was my job, to, to, keep, him, to keep him talking about incidences that he had gone through. And so it was, it was that cheerleader. It was totally involved with each other. And trust is huge. Like, we spent a lot of time apart, but he trusted me. He trusted that our family would still be strong. That was my job when he was away, and that was our job when we were together. And if he had to leave at a moment, or if he was calling me and saying, um, "Hun, something's happened, we have to come, you know, the, everybody's coming back, the family had to be normal, secure, and so it was dedicating my life, but not my children's life dedicating my life to becoming a strong part of what Walt felt so strongly about. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons, besides he's totally hot, um, <laughs> that... <laughs> ...to help get it through, but it's more than just his job or what was my job in life. It was about our family and what we wanted at the end, that when he came out of the military, he would be strong and healthy, and so would our marriage. And I keep saying we could make it through the space agency, even though my neighbor was sure he was always going to be going to outer space, <laughs> and why was he back so soon? And through that, I mean, I'm 100% I'm support him with what he does, um, because it's so important to Canada and to what he truly believes. Does that help? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Now, now Walt, you get a chance to... Uh... <laughs> She said it all. She's the she, hot one. <laughs> she, that's right. she said it all. Can I just say that, uh, that Leslie was the champion for military families and the champion for the wounded, ill, and injured, our men and women in, in uniform. Uh, we have three kids. Uh, each one of them is in the Cain Forces. I've got a daughter who's a medic in the Navy. I've got a son who's a pilot. And the youngest of the, is uh, our baby is a combat engineer. Hmm. And, you know, they've all made their choice. And I say, Leslie's my special forces. And then she tells me she's not a silent service. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you just saw that. <laughs> so I would say you're both the epitom epitomized leadership on the job and at home. Wow. Uh, over here. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, <clears throat> Sir Jim House is my name. I'm, uh, 
I have a foot in both camps today. I'm a, I'm a veteran of 20 years and also um, alumni of the first uh, MBA program through here in 99. Um, <clears throat> so for the folks that are not familiar with the military, um, General Nintenchuk is hot is something that I have never heard in any squad. <laughs> <laughs> Darn right. <laughs> <laughs> but sir, thank you very much for, uh, you know, for, the, for, the, for, the, for giving us your career and uh, providing us the leadership that you did. But mostly, thank you very much for the work that you're doing right now with Veterans Affairs. I think that that is mm. extraordinary work. And um, having that strong voice in Ottawa is something that, uh, that we will continue to need for, for years to come. Um, <clears throat> my question to you both, since um, um, you've now worn the political hats, you've obviously have lots of experience with the, uh, with the military hat, Bringing it around to leadership, which is what we're talking about today. Um, I had the opportunity to work as the uh, Director of Business Strategy for the province of Newfoundland post-career. And I too share your uh, comments about um, not lack of leadership, but maybe a little bit lack of direction at the, uh, in, the, in the political arena and mostly at the bureaucratic side. This is having um, what I think is a um, it's a, it's, a, it's a very uh, big impact on Canada as a society. And to be able to bridge the leadership experience that you have, and to be able to find a way to bring that into the bureaucratic side and into the political side of Canadian and uh, federal and provincial politics, um, I think that there might be a link between Royal Roads as a university perhaps, and the leaders that have gone through our schools, both RMC, Royal Roads, um, yourself, um, and uh, General Hillier, and so on and so forth, there, there's got to be a way, I think, uh, to, be able to, um, to be able to bring that leadership over into an area that the rest of Canada, the rest of the, the, uh, our society, um, can gain from. Have you given any thought, and that's my question, have you given any thought to maybe um, having a group, putting a, putting a team together to see if there's a way that, that, that we might be able to do that as former leaders and bringing some of that leadership um, out of the military and into, into uh, uh, the Canadian political society. Very good idea. Well, do you want to... Did you want to start that, that one, Mary? Well, you start it. I'll have something <laughs> to say about it, too. Yeah. Uh, I think it goes back to um, training and, and professional development because uh, those public servants who I've worked with in national defense, in the space agency, in veterans affairs, these are great Canadians, eh? These are just great Canadians. What they're lacking uh, is the years of staff college and, and various courses all the way through. And you know, about a month ago, I spoke to the public service planners course. And it wasn't even a course, it was kind of a week-long seminar. Uh, and all the planners from all the government departments all came together to kind of learn a little bit about planning. And what I said to them, I said, you know, I reckon by the time that I became a, you know, a, a, a colonel, um, in addition to learning how to be a tanker, I spent three years in various staff colleges, various uh, schoolhouses, learning about complex problem solving and how to lead. There's no other institution that does this. And, and the public service has a real issue, and, and that also goes to all the provinces across the country, with putting that level of, of resource into professional development. Uh, and, and yet it is absolutely essential because the problems in the public service, like they are in, in the commercial sector, are just as complex, but you're not dealing with uh, perhaps as often you know, lethal situations or deadly situations, but they're complex situations. And what I find is people come into these organizations with great academic backgrounds. You know, normally it's a, a postgraduate degree of some sort, and then they kind of rest on that. And that's not enough. And I still remember having a, a, a weekend. I went as a, I was the vice chief, and I was invited to go on a on a three-star course down in the United States. It was called a uh, pinnacle course for US three-star generals to go to a schoolhouse and learn. 
And I came out of that course, and it was all three-star generals and a bunch of retired four-stars putting them through the paces. And I came out of that school, I said, whoa, you know, it just kind of sharpened me up. Um, and so, from my view, there's not enough training happening, and this is a message that I'm sending. Every time I have an opportunity to, uh, to address a public service uh, conference, a school, what have you, I'm there. But this is something that each of the federal government and the provinces need to deal with because the problems that they will face will only get harder. Well, I would, would certainly agree with you. Just from a slightly different perspective, I have seen and still see today in my dealings with the public service, I mean, hugely dedicated people, but so often they're not really given the ability to take risks to make decisions and to speak truth to power. That's kind of an avoidance. Um, and it's that kind of environment that needs to change as well. And some of that comes back to the political environment, which, I mean, I'm a great supporter of those who go into political life. It's a hugely difficult area, and I think on the whole, most go in for the right reasons. There's always a few who don't. But there's something that kind of happens, and I think it actually comes back to a lot of things you talked about. The truth and valor sometimes get lost because people are afraid that the truth will hurt them, whether it's you know running for re-election or their reputation, and so they try to often avoid telling the whole truth. And I agree with you. It's better to tell the truth and get on with it and get it over with. Um, so yes, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm a great believer also in intermixing folks from the military, from the private sector, from the public sector, from uh, civil society, and giving people that experience for cross fertilization and learning from each other's cultures and have been involved in a number of those kinds of initiatives. Royal Roads, lots of opportunities here. Well, I think this brings us almost to the end, except if I can ask one last question. Now, tomorrow you're going to be addressing convocation, and I'm sure you'll be sharing some of your thoughts about leadership, but there may be a few here who aren't going to be there. Are there a couple of succinct messages that you'd like to just share with us today about what the graduates from Royal Roads should know the most important things about leadership? You're going to hear what I just told you. Okay. <laughs> Good. Say it again. So you have to say it three times to get the message across. No. It, 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 uh, I'll be saying uh, three, three points. The bit about values um, and talking about truth, duty, valor. Um, this uh, the second piece about um, of uh, identifying succession, um, and I just want to say to you, and, and Richard Greenwood knows this. I I made it through my first year here by the uh, hair of my chinny chin chin, <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, and had it not been for one of uh, Dr. Cahoon's uh, uh, predecessors, Dr. Eric Graham who was the director of, uh, of studies here between 1961 and 1984, he is the reason uh, that I'm here right now. Because otherwise, I was gone at Christmas of 1975. <laughs> I was a Christmas graduate after only four or five months in the program. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and Dr. Smart, if anyone knows Dr. Smart, who was uh, a great math prof who was here, you know, he's the guy who got me up to the board. And if you didn't get the derivative right, he just whacked you in a very nice way. <laughs> but here to be in, in first, second year university, and he would say, everybody up to the board, so you could not hide. But the idea and the example of, of Dr. Graham, uh, Dr. Smart, um, the commandant was uh, Captain Pierce, the idea of teach, coach, and mentor. You know, identify those who are going to replace you. And while you're there, teach them. Recognizing they're going to make mistakes. Coach them through those tough days. But mentor them for a long time. Because generally, those folks won't change. And I've been the recipient of mentorship from this front row. I could not be here without their direction, their support, over many, many years. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well,
turn it back to Catherine. Yeah, I will chime in to ask you to stay in your chairs for just a moment while we share a very small token of our great appreciation oh. for all that you've both shared today. I'll ask my colleague Karen actually to help me out with this and present to Mary and Walt with the gifts. Thank you. And that gives us a chance all to say thank you again That's for a really kind. inspirational thank afternoon. You. Oh. Thank you. 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 Thank you.